Okay, I'd like to get started. Uh, thank you all for coming today. It's a bit of a dreary day, but it's going to be livened up very shortly. We have a great speaker. I'm Neil Charnas. I'm the director of the Institute for Successful Longevity. And as a result, you're going to have to listen to a commercial. Maybe. Okay, so what is our institute and what are our goals? As you can see, we're a research institute here at Florida State University. And we're interested in trying to understand the mechanisms of age-associated disorders and functional, and particularly we're interested in cognitive decline. But if I can get it to move. We don't want to just chronicle what goes wrong. What we really want to do by understanding the mechanisms is finding ways to counter those types of age-related functional declines and in fact develop what we call the best holistic interventions to try to um, mitigate those declines. Oops. We also are interested in disseminating our knowledge. We don't just publish in academic journals and talk to fellow scientists. We're here today as an example to talk to, and we're very pleased, so many people from the community have come out to hear about the latest science in our area. And if we do a good job, we're hoping to be leaders in the nation in providing the scientific, social, and political leadership in a way that will engage our entire country. Here's what we're not. I always like this little cartoon. Um, it reminded me of a very famous episode a uh, long time ago on television called Kick the Can. Um, and this was uh, on, um, I guess, uh, Twilight Zone. You may remember that old show, Rod Serling's Twilight Zone. And um, in the episode, you saw all these older adults sitting out on the front porch in their rockers. And at the end of the episode, they ended up wandering away as uh, little kids again. Now, I think most of us don't want to become little kids again. In fact, most of us probably don't want to relive our teenage years anymore. So, what do I mean by successful longevity? And I'm not just pointing at Marilyn. Um, we need to give you a royalty. We're going to have to give her royalties, exactly. That wasn't my idea. This is Bill Edmonds' photography going on here. Um, and so what we really mean is that when an individual across their lifespan continues to be able to set, pursue, and reach their goals, then they have what I want to consider to be successful longevity. It's not how long you live, but how well you live while you're still here. Okay, so we have kind of two approaches to this. One of them is what we call planning and prevention. How do we ensure that people reach their senior years in the best possible physical and mental health? And for that, we mean things like avoiding damage, building up physical and cognitive reserve, exercise, particularly aerobic exercise, and mentally stimulating activities. However, we know that inevitably functions are going to decline. And when they do, we want to be able to use the best possible interventions. We want to restore a function, either by rehabilitation, or particularly the issue is compensation. And we're particularly interested in technological interventions that can help here. Things that can augment, or in some cases, perhaps substitute for failing uh, abilities as people age. And that brings us to our speaker, Roberto Cabeza from Duke University. And uh, sorry, I went a little bit too quickly here, but the title of this talk is going to be Compensation Processes in the Aging Brain. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, I'll try to get it all up here fairly quickly. Whoops, a little too quickly. <laughs> he did his undergraduate degree at University of Buenos Aires, but then he went on to, in 1994, get his PhD from the University of Tsukuba in Japan. <laughs> 
Uh, his international globe trotting didn't end there. He then did a postdoc with Endel Tolving and Randy McIntosh at the Rotman Research Institute associated with University of Toronto in Baycrest. And uh, in 1997, he got his first job as a professor, assistant professor, University of Alberta, Edmonton, so he knows what cold weather is all about. And he moved up through the ranks at that point when he moved to Duke University in 2001, assistant associate, and finally full professor. And he's a core member of the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience, which he'll be talking on that topic. And he's a senior fellow at the Center for the Study of Aging and Human Development. He has a long and distinguished record for such a young scientist. Uh, he got the Young Investigator Award from the Cognitive Neuroscience Society, the 2005 Bussey Research Award in Biomedical Sciences at the 18th World Congress Gerontology. From 2010 to the present, he's on the governing board of the Cognitive Neuroscience Society. 2012, helped on program. 2013, elected a fellow of the Society of Experimental Psychologists. In 2015, his country honored him, making him a professor honoris causa at Favaloro University in Buenos Aires, Argentina. He has the usual long list of accomplishments you'd expect of an academic. Over 200 peer-reviewed publications and proceedings papers. He has a lot, he's influenced a lot of people, citations. Over 36,000, he has what's called an H index of 84, which means he has at least of 84, of, he has at least 84 publications with 84 or more citations. So he's not only published a lot, but had a lot of impact on each publication. He serves on NA study panels, special emphasis panels. He served on review panels internationally, Canada, Argentina, Switzerland, US, Israel, UK, and Spain. He's had participated in over $17 million in funding from NIH, NIA here in the States, CIHR in Canada, NIMH, and many others. And he's a member of numerous editorial boards. And I won't list them all because I don't want to keep you here all day. I got to know him at a conference in Marseille back in 2004 um, when we were both invited speakers at a cognitive aging conference. And after the conference ended, the um, organizer of the conference, Patrick Lemaire, decided to take us to his favorite swimming hole, the Mediterranean Sea. So we hiked down the side of a fairly steep inclined mountain and came to, uh, there's the swimming hole, really beautiful looking place. But then he decided to test who were the risk takers in the group and who weren't. So we had to go out in a very rocky area with and it was not easy to climb into and out of the water. We both remember that. Uh, but he invited people, see the rock there in the middle, to climb up on the rock and dive in. And uh, I didn't do it. <laughs> but some other people did. And that's uh, Patrick Lemaire himself. He's got very good diving for him. That's one of his graduate students, she had very good diving for him. Not as good diving for him. So I was very pleased to know our speaker would not be taken up by the US Olympic swimming team, <laughs> diving team. So uh, he survived, obviously, he's here today. And I'm uh, very happy to uh, invite Roberto Cabeza to address us uh, on his compensation processes in the aging brain. That, that is not. Because you might have to get a little closer to trigger the. Uh... So it's not picking up the. Um... It's it's. Oh, the remote. Uh, yeah, the remote is too far away. Mm -hmm. That's what's having all that. Okay, so can you all hear me? Yes, yes? okay. So, so as, as the title indicates, uh, I will talk today about compensation processes in the aging brain. So you may be curious about this word compensation. I will try to define it. 
So, but let's start with a general kind of a framework uh, about uh, for my field. So, um, uh, yeah, I actually will probably need to move to this. Yes, uh, or you know what? Me... Yeah, it actually works from this side. Uh, is it okay from here? Yes. Yes. Okay. So. So one, uh, one of the major questions in cognitive aging, that is the, the, the area of science, science that we study how the cognitive abilities, and by that I mean memory, attention, and so forth, changes as of, during development, and is uh, what uh, processes are affected or decline with age and what processes are not. And uh, so the, the bad news is that many of the processes, so here, for example, as you can see, this is the, the um, a measure of the abilities, and these are different decades, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and so forth to 80s. So many of these processes tend to decline with age, and, and they decline, I mean, uh, quite uh, linearly, I mean, from the 20s. So this is not something that, that starts necessarily in, in old age. But the, the good news is that many of the processes actually are preserved, right? So, so for example, this includes some kind of language abilities, but also general knowledge about the world and experience. And th those, those type of abilities is that what they allow kind of uh, seniors to remain very successful in, in their everyday life and also in their professions into kind of uh, old age. So, so the question for, for, uh, uh, for us is, can spared cognitive abilities in older adults compensate for impaired ones? And I studied this question, but from the point of view of the brain. So in terms of the brain, we can uh, reframe this question in terms of uh, the question of brain activity. So uh, I typically use different techniques that can measure the activity of the brain while you are doing different types of cognitive tasks, such as memory tasks. And when you do that, you typically find that some brain regions will show less activity in older adults. So by the way, this is a view of the brain from the side. So, uh, so this will be like the front of the brain, the frontal lobes. This is kind of the back of the brain. That will be visual cortex, where we kind of uh, receive information coming from the eyes. Um, and if you look at that, you can see just by eyeballing and that this is a whole, the average of a whole group of older adults. Uh, uh, sorry, this is a mistake, I should say uh, older adults here. So this by, what I mean by older adults, typically in our studies, we compare people in their 20s, that will be the young adult group, and people in their 70s and 80s. So, so what you can see is that some brain regions show a reduced activity, such as this area, right, in visual cortex, whereas other regions show increased activity. So whereas the, the first group of uh, regions, the first effect, has been typically attributed to some type of deficit, the, the second type of effect, the increased activity, has, uh, is often attributed to compensation. So, but the, the question is, what does really compensation mean? So one... Um, to give you one example of compensation, something that many studies see is that older adults often activate both hemispheres of the brain in tasks in which young adults activate only one hemisphere. For example, in this study in 2002, we found that during this uh, was a memory task, young adults were activating primarily the right prefrontal cortex, the right frontal lobes, uh, and that older adults that were performing lower than, than, older, than young adults, we call them low-performing older adults, were showing very similar pattern of activity. But the critical difference was here in this third group of high-performing older adults that were performing as well as young adults. And as you can see, they actually were using also regions on the left hemisphere. So that points to the idea that sometimes to be successful in old age doesn't mean necessarily look like young adults, right? So it can be something different, for example, like using a different type of network of the brain to, uh, to achieve the best results. So, so not only always is looking like, the, like young adults, can be very different. So, but again, what do we mean by compensation? And just to explain that using a, a, a simile, let's, uh, I would like to compare compensatory activity to wearing eyeglasses. I mean, I think all of you will agree that wearing eyeglasses are, is compensatory, right? We are compensated for, 
for a, a visual deficits. So, for example, in a typical case, uh, there may be a, a distortion in the eye, shape of the eye, and then you wear eyeglasses to compensate so for that for that deficit, so that you can see better. So here, from that metaphor or simile, uh, we can make two requirements, identify two requirements to call compensatory activity as, a, as being kind of a, a, a change as being compensatory. So one is that a, there has to be a, an association. Sorry, it's just the, the clicking. It doesn't work on this side. Use the keyboard. Oh, OK, I will use the keyboard then. So I guess that's because if not, the, the, the camera wouldn't work. So, uh, so one, one requirement is that um, eyeglasses compensate for poor vision. So we can link a compensatory device to some type of deficit. So in the case of compensation, we will, the first requirement, and I will be coming back to these two requirements. So, so try to remember these two. So the first one is for being compensatory, it has to be a link or association with some type of deficit. Right? In the case of B, in the case of eyeglasses, it's an association with poor vision. And the second requirement is that it has to be associated with better performance, right? Because I mean we say that the glasses are compensatory because it, they help. Okay, so we can say that a change in activity is associated with uh, some type of deficit and with better performance, then we can use the term compensatory and assume that they kind of are helping older adults cope. Uh, with, with a deficit. Okay, so the studies I'm going to present are about memory. So I just want to give you a very brief kind of overview of how we think about the memory in the brain. So uh, we think that an event, something like what is happening here now, right, is being stored in different parts of the brain and you wouldn't have to remember all these regions, just only a few. So, so that visual information is stored in visual cortex let's say auditory information in auditory cortex uh, and so forth and let's say semantic information more about the meaning of the th of things will be stored more in a, in these areas that we call uh, this is the temporal lobe this will be more anterior temporal regions and there is one part of the brain that uh, like the hippocampus in this area that we call the medial temporal lobes that uh, is assumed to st uh, to store like a summary of the whole event, so that later, when you try to remember uh, or uh, see a retrieval cue, let's say, kind of we, we, we see each other on the street and you are rem rem reminded of being here, that will activate that cue, in the, activate that trace in the hippocampus, which leads to the reactivation of those cortical uh, memory traces, and that allows you the experience of remembering. Right, so you will get the, 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 the re-experience in being here and, and in this talk. So there's also important role played by these regions uh, like the frontal lobes and the parietal cortex, which kind of help control these processes when you are learning, that is when you're having the first experience for the first time, and when you're trying to remember it. Right, so you don't need to remember all these areas, so, but you need to kind of, I will talk in today about these four. Visual cortex, right, where we assume the memory traces are stored. Anterior temporal lobes here, where we think that the more meaning-based information is stored. The hippocampus and the medial temporal lobes, where kind of a, the, this summary information that is critical for remembering is stored. And finally, the frontal lobes. So the frontal lobes are regions that help control all these processes. It's like the CEO of this kind of managing the whole the whole process of memory. Okay, so, so now uh, let's, let's uh, talk about the method that they use. So it's functional MRI, which is similar to the MRI that is used kind of to see if you kind of, uh, for medical purposes, right? To, uh, but there's, uh, the functional MRI, uh, as the word functional means, it allows you to measure changes in function. In the case of the brain, will be changes in activity. So it's based on measuring changes in the, in the oxygenation of the blood that will be associated with changes in neuronal activity nearby. So indirectly, fMRI can measure changes in brain activity. So an fMRI can provide three different types of measure. And today's talk will be organized by these 
three types of different measures that it can provide. First, it can measure activity, so how much a brain region is active during a task. So basically, uh, you will have, let's say that you have two conditions, A and B, and you see more activity in condition A than condition B. So that will be the type of finding that you get from, from a mean, a, the mean activity means the average of the activity of one region. Then you have what uh, activity patterns. So here is not so much about the overall level, but about the particular distribution of the activity within this area, right? So here I typically, we often color code this so that here yellow is more activity, right? And red is le less, and right? So, so that you can see this is, these are, these, uh, these are these, uh, um, different parts within this area are what we call kind of voxels, which are like the pixels of the brain in the brain imaging, right, where you can see. So here we can say, okay, this, these two patterns, how similar or different are from each other. And that, we assume, represents, it provides us information about the type of information that is stored within one brain region. And finally, we also measure functional connectivity, which is kind of variations in the activity over time. And that tells us where two regions are talking to each other, right? So if the regions are kind of being active more or less at the same time, they will be assuming they are communicating, okay? So, so then uh, I will kind of uh, use this type of evidence, the fMRI data, to look at three different aspects of the network I just showed you. So these are the regions I mentioned, right? The frontal lobes, uh, the visual cortex, the anterior temporal lobes, and the medial temporal lobes. So these are the regions. In a way, if we were kind of trying to understand the brain uh, as uh, understanding what our group of people communicating information, let's another, another uh, simile, right? Imagine that the information processing in the brain, you can imagine is that each region being one person talking to each other and exchanging information. So the first person is who's talking, right? So here the level of activity is kind of how loud they are can tell you which of these regions is actively being involved, right? The second question is how these regions are connected. This is functional connectivity. You would see them by when they are actually talking at the same time, right? And so is that who's talking to whom will be the type of question that we ask. And finally, the activity patterns that uh, tell us about the type of information that is being exchanged, right? So this is kind of a, what are they talking about? Okay, is that clear so far? The, the type of things that, that we are trying to do. So identify the parts of the brain that are being active, see how they communicate with other parts of the brain, and they see, try to see the, what type of information they are exchanging. And the last one will be measured by the quality of the representations or these patterns of activity that we see inside this region. So today I will talk about these, uh, these uh, three forms of compensations, showing you one example of each of these two, three types of evidence. First, I mean, we'll talk what they call less wiring, more firing, which is the finding that older adults show greater brain activity to compensate for impaired Y matter. So Y matter kind of recovers the, uh, the, the axons that connect different brain regions. is like the cables that connect these different parts of the brain. And the findings suggest that when those cables are less effective, then, then actually the regions will be more active to compensate for that. Second, the second one will talk about PASA, which stands for posterior anterior, posterior anterior shift with aging, and, refer, and then in particular in the area of connectivity, I will show you that older adults display greater frontal connectivity to compensate for reduced medial temporal lobe connectivity. So basically the frontal lobes are trying to pick up some of the, the work that the medial temporal lobes are not doing as well, right? So we see a compensation in the connectivity of these regions. And finally, this is what I call here chicken tongue kind of meaning over matter. All the, all, all the adults rely more on meaningful representations in the anterior temporal lobe to compensate for the differentiated visual representations in early visual cortex. So here we see kind of the meaning paying attention or processing meaning, compensating for a reduction in the ability to process kind of visual details or visual uh, information. Okay, so let's start with the, with the first part. So if I glasses compensate for poor vision, what does increased activity in older adults compensate for? So one possible answer 
is that they compensate for reduced uh, Y matter. So and, uh, this is uh, the hypothesis that we investigated. And, and as I said, we call it here less wiring because the wiring is like kind of white matter is like the wires connecting different brain regions and firing because that's a kind of a, it's assumed to be underlying the brain activity, right? So more neuronal firing. So uh, here I will need to introduce another technique in addition of functional MRI and that's called diffusion tensor imaging. So diffusion tensor imaging measures the diffusion of water mo molecules, right? So they, and, and they can measure whether they are more moving in all directions or they are moving more in a, in a, a line in a certain direction. And that happens when the water molecules are constrained by Y matter, for example. So the more constrained, the more directional the movement is, the better the Y matter. So, so we use that to identify fibers of white matter and then we can see uh, using this measure of fractional and isotropy, which basically tells you how directional is the, um, is the movement, how oriented they are. And we can see that, that you can, uh, this is just one young adult and one older adult, you can see that here color coded, that there is a reduction in those fibers kind of, uh, uh, from in the, uh, that are linking left and right frontal cortex and you can actually get the mean fiber and the age effect color coded like here. So just to show you the general effect, for example, this is one study in which we find kind of how, how white matter kind of is reduced uh, or impaired uh, the quality in older adults, uh, particularly in the frontal regions, right? And, and this effect in frontal regions uh, is associated with the executive uh, function scores, which is kind of uh, these control processes of the brain that allows managing the different tasks or, com or maintaining different kind of uh, uh, goals at the same time. Uh, and, um, but also in these more posterior, like the inferior longitudinal fasciculus here, which is a fiber in the temporal lobes, which connects to the hippocampus, right? So, and this actually, this effect was correlated, was associated with uh, worse memory. So just the point here is that white matter tends to decline with aging, particularly in the frontal lobes, but also in some temporal areas. And this effect is associated with executive uh, scores, and this is with more with memory, individual differences in memory. So uh, what we did is to test this less wiring, more firing hypothesis, is to measure brain activity using functional MRI, measure white matter quality using diffusion tensor imaging, and then relate the two. So if it's true that increased activity compensate for white matter, then we should see that regions that are showing reduced white matter should be uh, associated with regions that show more activity and the two effects should be negatively associated. When the more, the less, the worse the white matter, the more the activity, okay? So uh, just to, I mean, let me skip just to the point here. In the frontal lobes, we actually found that the uh, frontal here in red is a region that is showing less kind of fractional anisotropy. Remember that fractional anisotropy was this measure of white matter quality. In the older adults that had lower executive functions than those that had higher executive functions. So basically, the, we find that executive functions uh, in older adults are related to the white matter quality, but they also nearby we found a region showing more activity in the, in the individuals with low executive function, right? So basically the opposing effect. So this, we can interpret that as compensatory, particularly because here is not just activity overall, but we call here RSA or retrieval success activity, which is only activity associated with successful memory performance. So just by definition, this activity is associated with success. So actually more activity is actually helpful for performance, which remember is our second criterion. So you can see here already the two criteria, right? So the first is that this is associated with a, with a reduction, but also the second is that this is associated with success. And the, and the first point about the reduction you can see here, those individuals that show more activity, right, uh, show actually um, a reduction. Those individuals that show kind of a, a frontal white matter integrity, so a reduction, we're actually showing the negative effect, more activity in that region. So more activity were associated with lower fractional anisotropy.
So, so basically, I just want to emphasize these two points again. Then these regions, uh, those uh, older adults that show reduced white matter quality, that is the, the quality of the wires kind of connecting the regions, were showing more activity, suggesting compensation. And supporting this idea, we find that the two effects are negatively associated. The worse the wires, the more the activity, right? So it seems that the, and second, the more the activity, the better the memory performance, the second criteria, okay? So we found the same effects in the middle temporal lobes. Uh, in this case, for the difference will be in memory scores. Uh, and so we found that a reduction for the low memory individuals in white matter, an increase in the low memory individuals for activity, and a negative association between the two. So just uh, to summarize the first, uh, the first part of the talk, then the the less wiring, more firing. We found that uh, the hypothesis uh, that increased activity in older adults may compensate for impaired white matter was supported. First, we, uh, we do that by measuring brain activity with fMRI and white matter with diffusion tensor imaging. And we found that in both frontal and medial temporal lobe regions, impaired white matter was associated with increased activity, supporting the compensation criterion number one, and uh, for successful memory trials supporting the criterion number two. Okay, so this is, our, I, I think, it's a very clear example of how increased activity can be beneficial for older adults in terms of compensate for some structural <coughs> changes such in white matter. Okay, turning now to the second uh, example of compensation. Now I, I would like to introduce this phenomenon that we call posterior anterior shift with aging, or PASA, just in the paper in which we published this, we call it Kepasa, the title of the paper. <laughs> so, and, uh, so this has been, these, uh, these effects have been replicated in dozens of studies. It's a very common, and the effect is that in general activity in posterior brain areas tends to be reduced in older adults, whereas activity in the anterior areas, like the frontal lobes, tend to be increased. And, the, and there is evidence that the two effects are related to each other. So again, it fits both compensation criteria. For example, in this uh, study, for example, from 2008, we found that the, 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 the lower the occipital activity, so these are different individuals, right? The lower the, 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 the individuals with less occipital activity were showing more frontal activity, right? So the, the, there's a negative association. And second, we found, uh, consistent with criteria number two, the amount of frontal activity was associated with, with performance, how well they did in terms of perception and memory. So the more the frontal activity, the better their performance, right? So again, it fits both criteria. But they want to talk not about the effect, the PASA in, in terms of activity, but a similar PASA effect in terms of functional connectivity. So just to in introduce again the difference, activity is just about the overall kind of a level of a recruitment of a region, how engaged the region is. Whereas connectivity refers about two regions or more regions that are communicating on time. And we see that the activity of being uh, coupled together, right? So just to give you an example, I will show you the activity of three regions as a function of time, region one, region two, and region three, right? So you see that activity over time. We can measure that with fMRI, right? So which regions are you think are talking to each other here? One and two, right? Because they show a very similar pattern. So we say that this is kind of a stronger functional connectivity because they are the, the two functions are correlated, right? So it's kind of saying, okay, well, I mean, who know who, who is talking on the phone, okay? If they shout at the same time, then they're probably talking to each other, right? Because they're probably maybe in a, in a fight or something, right? So when they're both quiet at the same time, so it's kind of a tracking that communication over time. So. So there is previous evidence that in older adults, kind of uh, the, 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 the frontal activity, the connectivity tends to be stronger in older adults, whereas the medial temporal lobe, remember that area that keeps like a record of the unified event that you remembered, uh, tends to be reduced. So uh, uh, for example, in one study, we found that when we look at kind of hippocampal connectivity was reduced, as you can hear in bluer areas, that were reduced in connectivity with the hippocampus uh, in older adults, but older adults show actually stronger connectivity in the frontal lobes. Uh, 
In this other study, we found that for the amygdala, another brain region, uh, just to show you that, that also there's an increase in frontal connectivity. And here in a, in a third study, we also, you can see here, the bars are not indicating activity, but the strength of the connectivity, basically, if you think before, will be how similar these functions are, right? And you see that older adults, here in red, are showing less connectivity uh, in posterior areas, but the, the older adults are showing a stronger connectivity in the frontal lobes. So it is not, I mean, just the point I want kind of emphasizing several times is that it's not that everything is going downhill with aging, right? So you see some effects that actually may be re reduced, but many other regions are trying to kind of uh, picking up, kind of uh, reacting against that, I mean, the way that we interpret that, in order to compensate for those changes. And in this case, we see that as an increase in the communication, right, that the region communicating more with the rest of the brain. And so the question we ask is, does increased frontal connectivity in older adults compensate for re reduced medial temporal lobe connectivity? So to, we, to investigate that, we use uh, several methods from network analysis and, and, and just uh, some network analysis can be explained and with another simile, which is Facebook, right? So in Facebook, and both in, the, in Facebook and the brain, they consist of many information processing units, I mean, fa people in Facebook or brain regions in the case of the brain that are connected to each other, I mean, by internet cables and, and uh, uh, or in, the, in Facebook or by why matter tracks, right, in, in case of the brain, and that exchange information. So, I mean, there will be the posting or messages in Facebook or the neuronal transmission in case of the brain. So, so many of the, of the uh, methods that can be used to understand networks, such as social networks, such as Facebook, can be applied also to the brain. And there is a, a different methods, including one that's called graph theory, that have been used to understand these networks. So, I wouldn't go into the details about that, but just to mention that a network is the consist of nodes, which are these units, would be people in the case of Facebook, or brain regions in the case of the brain, and the edges, which are the connections between them, right? Uh, and then you can identify modules, which are groups of regions, brain regions, or group of people that tend to be more close to each other, communicating more than with the rest. In the case of Facebook, for example, this is a good example. This is actually the Facebook friends of one person, and, and each of these, uh, each of these uh, dots is one friend, and each of these lines is, is, uh, is whether they are friend in Facebook. So, and, and you can see this person was able to identify a group of people that they know from college, here in, in purple, a, a group of people that they were know from high school, uh, people that they are uh, 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 friends of his girlfriend, and, 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 and friends that are from the, and also people that they know from the university, probably he's a, so he's an, a, a professor, right? So he has colleagues at the university. And just by looking at that, you can see clearly that there are four groups of people, right? That they are, they are closer to each other. Obviously, the, the high school friends know each other better, right, than, than with each other. They are friends with each other and so forth with the college friends. And so these, these are what we call modules. So modules are groups of densely interconnected nodes, right? And we can look at the same on the brain, and it's a very useful way of looking at how, how the brain functions. So when we can look at the connections, or whether they are connections within one group or connections between groups. So, so we can call them inside module. For example, if you have these three modules, the orange module, the red <coughs> module, and the blue module, you can look at the connections within each of the modules, or you can look at the connections between the modules. So this is a, it's interesting because it's kind of different types of connectivity, right? You may be just kind of uh, just communicating only within your college friends uh, or, or kind of uh, these communications across are more widespread. And there is a general finding that older adults tend to show more of this whole brain connectivity than young adults. Again, it seems to be a kind of a recruitment of the possibilities of expanding neural networks to the whole brain. So I, I will show you some examples of that. So we did this study uh, and that the, in which we looked at the activity during a memory task in, in young and older adults, and we then identify these modules, right, that can, we found several of these modules. I mean, there was a module in, in the medial temporal lobes, another modules in the frontal lobes, and so forth. 
And then we looked at the inside connectivity and the outside connectivity. So the first finding is that uh, here is that showing what we call whole brain integration, which is the difference between versus within. So for example, let's say that you, you take one, one group, uh, one module, let's say the, the, the college friends, how long, how much these, within this module they talk within the, the college friends and how much they talk with all the other, the other groups in that, uh, in that network, right? And we find that older adults showed reduced kind of uh, a connectivity within the medial temporal lobe in whole brain integration, but increased whole brain integration of the frontal lobe. So, so even though the medial temporal lobe is a, bit, is a bit isolated in the case of older adults, and doesn't communicate so much with the rest of the brain as in the young, the frontal lobes are actually compensating by having a much broader communication with the rest of the brain. The second finding is that actually when you look at this between connectivity, the connectivity with different modules, it was actually greater in older adults for high memory trials than for low memory trials. So in the, in the times in which older adults were successful in making a memory, they remember that, that they actually had stronger integration across the whole brain from the frontal lobes, which suggests that then that connectivity is helpful for performance, which is the second criterion for compensation, right? So how about the first criterion? Well, that's our uh, first finding. When we found that using a, a reconfiguration, which is a basically qualitative difference between two networks. We can look at the, take one node, for example, or one module, and look at how it's connected to the rest of the, of the, of the nodes, and then in a low memory trials and in high memory trials, uh, and then we can compare how, uh, how much it changes. So uh, if it changes a lot, then we say it's a high reconfiguration. Basically, the whole network has been reorganized. And, and again, we find that, uh, that in the medial temporal lobes, there is a reduction in reconfiguration. So the medial temporal lobes is a bit, kind of a bit rigid in older adults. It doesn't reconfigure as much. It doesn't change as much with memory. But the frontal lobes actually shows the opposite, right? The frontal lobes actually is reconfiguring more in older adults. But the nice thing here is that also we found these two effects to be negatively associated, consistent with the, with the compensation one. So again, so, the, the more rigid your, the, the medial temporal lobes are in older adults, the more flexible the, the frontal lobes become. And the two effects are, are kind of uh, so are negatively associated, but the, that, that flexibility in the frontal lobes is associated with better performance. So again, I think we have the, the, two, the two requirements to call it compensatory. So just to summarize the second part of the talk, uh, so the, the posterior anterior shift with aging or PASA, fulfills both compensation criteria and can be observed not only in activity but also in functional connectivity. All the results often show increased frontal lobe connectivity coupled with reduced media con uh, temporal connectivity. I talk about Facebook simile and network concept, but here is a new study. All the results showed reduced medial temporal lobe integration with the rest of the brain, but increased, sorry for the typos, frontal integration, which was associated with successful memory trials, so consistent with the compensation criteria number two. And then the age-reduced age reconfiguration but increased frontal reconfiguration, and the two effects were negatively correlated, consistent with criteria number one. So uh, now going to the third part of the talk. So uh, Neil, what do you prefer? I can go over that uh, or, or just uh, give more time for questions? OK. So, um, so meaning over matter, so this is a chicken and, and tag kind of uh, idea that uh, you older adults tend to emphasize meaning. So uh, as, a, a, as aging generally spares conceptual knowledge, right? So not only older adults show kind of uh, improvement in, in vocabulary and language over, over time. I mean, they are spared, but also they, they know they have better, greater knowledge and also experience that, uh, I mean, expertise is a topic that Neil has studied extensively. I mean, the, with expertise, uh, that, that can compensate actually for, for deficits in other kind of speed of processing, right? So you may not be as fast as when you were young, but you know much more and you have much more experience to rely on and that can compensate and can, is one of the reasons why kind of uh, older adults can be, remain effective in their daily life and in their professions into old age because they have all this uh, accumulation of knowledge or what some, sometimes is called crystallized intelligence that is relatively spared by, by the aging process. So um, 
And also, there is evidence that mean intend to attenuate memory deficits in older adults. So, for example, evidence suggests that, for one example, a clear example, when older adults try, are asked to remember word pairs, so a pair of associated words, right? So, remember, okay, the, the, these two words together, I mean, tree and cow. Okay, if the words are unrelated, older adults have difficulty, right? But if the words are related, they actually do the task as well as young adults partly because they can rely on the knowledge about the relationships, or how things go in the world, right, the knowledge, and then they actually don't show those deficits. So, in general, when there is a meaning, when things make sense, older adults can do quite well, I mean, as well as young adults. So, so this is an important. They, they tend to rely on meaning to compensate for other deficits, such as speed of processing or, or some other type of more sensory deficit. So, I don't know why it turned black, uh, white, but... Uh, Okay, so um, then, um, so one phenomenon that has been, that has been seen in, in several studies is that uh, when you look at regions that are sensitive in the brain to different types of information, such as some brain regions may be sensitive to faces, some other brain regions may be sensitive to places or houses or different types of things, there is uh, all that does do not show that uh, distinction so clearly. So, the, the, for example, the regions that respond to only to faces, or primarily to faces in young adults, they tend to respond more, in general, to all other stimulus in older adults. So, the, the, the patterns are less distinctive. So, this has been replicated many times and, and has been associated with, uh, with impaired abilities. However, there, were kind of, uh, there are several limitations uh, in previous studies. Uh, in particular, they only looked at kind of a... Uh, uh, stimulus that are very distinct, different from each other, and, and hence the, the, the distinction is based more on these sensory properties. And they also didn't look at more anterior brain regions, such as the anterior temporal lobes, that are associated with meaning. Okay, so good, it went back to, <laughs> to the normal. That, that slide was probably changed when we moved from the uh, laptop to the. Okay, so, um, so we studied the age effects on visual versus a semantic representation. So visual processing is impaired by the aging, I mean, partly because of changes that start in the eye, right, from the, from, uh, and, but also in the optical nerve, and there are changes in visual cortex. So in general, the quality of visual information is reduced by aging, and that leads to kind of a reduced kind of sensitivity to visual details and some changes in visual cortex. But there is evidence that then meaning of the information can compensate for that, right? When you know what you're seeing, when you know what you're expecting, that allows you to, you don't need to see all the details when you know what you're expecting, right? So this type of meaning can help compensate for the sensory deficit. So we did a task in which people had to see pictures such as this with a label, such as ocean wave, and then during the, the memory uh, scans in the, in the scanner, they had to remember the picture. So they just got a label and they had to kind of remember the specific picture that of an ocean wave and rate how, how good was the memory, right, from one to four. Uh, and then uh, outside the scanner, we tested them in very similar pictures of that ocean wave or other pictures. And this requires really detailed memory and they also rate their confidence. So, and, and we have shown that the, the, the ratings in the, in the scanner actually predicted quite well so they are valid measures of, uh, of memory because they predicted how well they did outside the scanner. And you can see here the young and older adults. There is a general reduction in memory, but both show this clear pattern as a function of the rating in the scanner. Okay, so we focus, uh, and now I'm going to focus kind of uh, in the memory, uh, comparing both the, the encoding part and also the relationship between encoding and retrieval. And here I have to introduce another technique. It's a bit complicated, so a bit. Uh, so it's called representational similarity analysis, and this is a, te a technique that we use to try to get to the content of the information. So far, I mean, the, what I show you is about how one brain region is activated, how much, how hard is working, or how it communicates with other regions. But when we want to get into what type of information is being processed, this technique allows that. So. Uh, one way of doing that is you start with a model, which is a kind of a, a, about the stimuli that you are using. Let's say that we are using these pictures of objects. I mean, it, we did it with the uh, scenes, but just it's clear to show you here with these objects. Imagine that you want to see how these objects are resemble each other. 
So if you look at visual similarity, right, so you would say, well, I mean, the, here color coded is in blue is low similarity, kind of a yellow orange is intermediate similarity, and, and red is very high. Of course, when you look at the, the similarity between the pumpkin and the pumpkin, this is the maximum, right, because they are identical, right? And, and here you would say, how, how similar is the, the pumpkin to the other stimulus? In terms of visual similarity, you have to argue, well, yeah, the, the pumpkin is similar to the basketball, right? Because they are both round and orange. It looks very similar, right? So this is, and then in contrast, the, 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 the pumpkin is very different than the racquetball, right? Because the shape is very different. So then you can create a, 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 this matrix that indicates how each stimulus is similar or different from each other stimulus in one dimension, in this case, visual properties, right? So this, th then you can use that to identify what parts of the brain are coding for that type of information because they will tend to show the same pattern of similarity across stimuli, right, as you see in, those, in, in, in your set of uh, stimuli. Now, the nice thing of this method is you can look at many different types of uh, information. Here is an example of visual information. But you can also look at semantic similarity. In this case, you will say, well, now the pumpkin is very different in terms of meaning than the basketball, right? But the, 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 instead, you will say the basketball here now is actually very similar to the, the basketball is very similar to the racquetball, right? Because they are both sport equipment. So things that look very different can have a similar meaning, right? So you can create another different matrix like that for based on meaning. And then you will have kind of a, a model that describes similarities in, in visual properties, a model that describes similarity in semantic properties, and then you can relate that to the brain and see what parts of the brain are storing different types of information. And then you can look how aging is affecting that type of information. Right? So that will be equivalent of kind of a, a so if you have, because this is done presenting many stimuli, right? So it will be equivalent of saying kind of a, a, a taking a, a can, kind of speaking many different languages and see what parts of the brain respond when you, when words in German are presented or when words in French are presented, right? So the words that, the, the, the similarity, kind of the, the brains that will respond to German or to French will be different, right? So you can look back to those to this region. In, case, in this case, we focus on visual and semantic. Uh, we also looked at, so I guess that's the problem of changing from my laptop to the, uh, this, uh, we also look at what we call encoding retrieval similarity, in which we take kind of uh, the, uh, here it should be the, the slide for the retrieval, right, where we, people will remember it. We take a brain region for encoding, we take that to retrieval, and we see how the similarity in a pattern is when you learn for the first time, and when you remember. So how similar is the brain when you learn and when you retrieve? How similar is your brain when you saw for the first time that ocean wave and when you are trying to remember that ocean wave? So the more similar it is, the better is the quality of the memory trace, right? That means that you can, your brain is a more similar state. So we use that to measure the quality of memory representation. Okay, so when we look at that, we see that uh, the visual model, so that model that uh, identifies region associated with uh, visual, uh, visual representations, as expected, give us regions that are visual cortex. Uh, and if you look at that, you can see that older adults are showing a reduced fit with the model. They, let's say that the, the, the visual areas in older adults are not as sensitive to the differences in the quality of, of those stimuli. Wouldn't fit as well with the similarity that we measure in, in, I don't have time to talk, but we, we assess the similarity in visual between all the stimuli, and all the adults are not, not fitting as well. But when we look at the semantic model, and we get here some more anterior areas for that, actually all the adults are showing much more uh, in a kind of fit here, a better fit with the semantic model than young adults. So actually these regions are representing more subtle differences in the meaning of the stimuli better than in young adults. So to, to investigate that more, we look at the, uh, at the um, kind of a look at the visual memory, the visual model and the semantic model, visual model, semantic memo model in a posterior area, the early visual cortex, and in the anterior temporal lobes. Uh, 
Uh, and we can see here that the, the visual cortex here in the visual model show a reduction in the fit between the model and the brain. That is, the, just to simplify, what's the quality of the information, if visual information is reduced by aging, and this fits with the idea of hyper, uh, sorry, the, the, the differentiation I mentioned before. So the, the representations are impaired by aging. But when we look at, at the semantic uh, model in the anterior temporal, we actually see older adults to show in a better fit. So we call that hyper differentiation. So whereas yeah, where older adults seems to have a, a deficit in the quality of the representations, visual representations in posterior brain areas, older adults seems to have actually not only preserved, but actually better m a semantic or meaningful representations in more anterior brain areas like the anterior temporal lobes. Um, so this is the first evidence uh, that we know about hyperdifferentiation in older adults, and it's consistent with this, uh, this evidence of older adults relying more on meaning. So and, and now taking to the encoding and retrieval similarity, uh, again we see that in posterior areas and in the hippocampus, older adults show a reduction in this encoding and retrieval similarity measure, but, uh, um, young, but older adults showing actually better kind of encoding and retrieval similarity uh, than young adults, even when we look at just what we call item, which is similarity for I specific items compared to the whole set, so quite specific to, to each of the items. And, and importantly, that encoding retrieval similarity was associated with better memory overall across subjects uh, in older adults. So those, those uh, older adults that show that, that uh, high, uh, ERS, higher ERS, were performing better in this memory task. So again, fitting with the se second criteria for compensation. So just to summarize then, then the, the third part, older adults display reduced neural specificity for different kinds of visual stimulus or the differentiation. Uh, I presented a new study showing using representational similarity analysis and encoding retrieval similarity measures. And uh, we found that older adults display the differentiation of visual representations in early visual cortex, but hyper differentiation of semantic representations in the anterior temporal lobe. And then they also showed impaired memory representations in visual cortex and hippocampus, but enhanced memory representations in the anterior temporal lobe. This, I mean, for me, this, particularly this finding was uh, really surprising because kind of it's actually showing better memory representations in older adults, which is something that gets to the point of not just how much a region is involved, but about the quality of the information can be better in older adults. And, and importantly, this the second effect was associated with better memory performance, consistent with the second criterion for compensation. So just to, just to summarize, uh, the general concepts, the Asian brain does not endure neural decline passively, but it actively compensates for it. Like eyeglasses, compensation can be linked to a deficit, criteria number one, and it's associated with improved performance, criteria number two. FMRI can show age-related compensation as increased activity, that is the involvement of regions, greater functional connectivity, that is networks, how the regions communicate to each other, and different activity patterns, that is the quality of the representations. And DTI can be used to assess why matter quality. I show you three studies. Uh, first, study one showed that activity in both frontal and medial temporal regions impaired why matter in uh, older adults was associated with increased activity, consistent with criterion one, which was linked to successful memory performance, criterion number two, as I remember, that, that was greater for successful than unsuccessful trials. Uh, study two in function and connectivity or networks. Uh, age reduced reduce medial temporal lobe integration with the rest of the brain, but increased frontal integration for successful mem memory trials consistent with criterion two. And frontal and medial temporal lobe reconfiguration were negatively correlated consistent with criterion number one, so the negative effect. So finally, for activation patterns, older adults displayed the differentiation in early visual cortex by hyperdifferentiation in the anterior temporal lobe. And in the anterior temporal lobe, they also showed enhanced memory representations measured via ERS, uh, which was linked to better performance, consistent with criteria number two. So bottom line, the Asian brain does not, does not take it lying down. It fights very hard and wins several rounds, anyway. So thank you.
questions, uh, I want to also remind you we have a reception that will take place outside with hors d'oeuvres and uh, some drinks. And that will be another opportunity to uh, hopefully have a, a, a brief conversation with our speaker. But uh, any questions? Uh, because I, do you take into account time? I mean, the time it takes to make the connection. For instance, I can remember stuff. I can't remember stuff immediately, but I may remember it 24 hours later. Uh -huh. When I was young, I could do it like this. Mm -hmm. So in your studies, between the young adults and the older adults, what did you do with time? Yeah, no, the, this is a very good point. I mean, the, the, uh, one of the kind of uh, the, among the functions that tend to decline with aging, one is speed. And obviously, kind of uh, most, uh, uh, we know, I mean, uh, uh, that uh, as we get older, we kind of uh, are slower in many of the cognitive processes. Uh, and we try, uh, I mean, to at least kind of uh, uh, be sure that we don't put too much pressure in the, in the older adults in the scanning by be sure that they can respond comfortably within the time they have. Let's say that in this task in which they had to recall, we, we kind of do kind of a, some pilot testing just with no limit, just to be sure that they have enough time before we decide how long we need. Let's say that we give four seconds to, to try to remember a word, for example. We present an, uh, an associate, for example, or, or to respond. So, but, but, uh, but I see, I mean, it's true that, I mean, we cannot account by the way we do the, the, the studies for kind of differences uh, like the next day, right? So we didn't know if some of the, of the things that couldn't be done in the scanner, perhaps the, the person remembers them the next day. Yeah, so we, we cannot kind of uh, accommodate for that. But as much as we can, we try to account, uh, be sure that we uh, allow enough time to, to seniors to be able to do the tasks and also ensure that they are, they are performing uh, relatively well. I mean, m actually many of the tasks, uh, that we do, I mean, because we tend to use also a very healthy volunteers. I mean, these are, are, I would say, I mean, if there is one weakness of our studies is that uh, uh, because we work with volunteers that once are willing to do imaging work, they, 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 they are not necessarily quite representative of the aging population. I mean, they are, they are uh, actually sometimes we even have difficulty finding age-related declines because some of them actually are are perform as well and sometimes even better than the young. So, so but they, in, depending on the task, right? So, for example, in the recall task, as you show you, the word clear differences because recall is, is demanding. But if you do other simpler tasks, such as deciding, have you seen this before, like a recognition task, sometimes they do as well as, as young adults. So. Yeah, that's question here. Um, in terms of memory, does the brain understand when senses are compensated? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's an interesting question. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure the, the studies have been done to see changes in the brain after starting using glasses or hearing aids. But uh, I imagine that there is a period of adjustment in which probably there may be, depending on, on glasses perhaps less so, I mean, in terms of that they can be mimicked relatively well, I mean, the quality of the visual information, although, I mean, it's, as you know, it's, very, it's almost impossible to find perfect glasses because, I mean, either they are good for, for reading or for dot distance and uh, you never kind of uh, completely, so, I mean, these changes are definitely require some adaptation and, and I'm sure that if a study was done uh, longitudinally follow the brain as a person become a, a, a used to using glasses, new glasses or, or hearing aids, you will see uh, some adaptation of the, of, the, of the brain networks to adjust for that. So these studies have been done for, for other things. I mean, not necessarily about that, but it has been done, see how people kind of uh, adjust to, to actually, for, for example, seeing the world upside down, kind of some studies have given people glasses that actually kind of invert the world. And at first you cannot even walk, and then you learn to, to, to move and, uh, and adjust to that. So many studies have looked about how how behavior and the brain kind of adjust to, to those changes, and, and there is a kind of a, a process. So I'm sure that, that there are adaptations to that, and some may be co completely compensate for that, and some may never kind of completely adjust, right? So at least I still never adjust to my glasses, so. 
Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, in general, you could say that, that uh, I mean, there are, of course, I mean, we remember that we are measuring in brain function or neural, uh, neuronal activity or neuronal firing indirectly, right? So, but assuming that, 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 that our measure is tracking kind of a neuronal firing, I mean, we can, you can say that more activity generally is, is the region is more engaged, more and more. Uh, well, I mean, the, the, sometimes you actually see, I mean, more activity the, when you are, it's more demanding, right? So, because you are kind of trying to compensate for that, right? So. I guess my point is, is we, our benefit is from increased learning, activity, reading, mm -hmm. stay Oh, no, yeah, that, that, that's kind of a, the, this is a, 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 another domain, I mean, kind of a, here we have an expert in, in kind of uh, this, uh, Neil Charnes and his group have been doing this work for years. I mean, it's not so much in my area, but there's a lot of work showing, yeah, that the intellectual engagement and, and can have a beneficial effect. And, and so that uh, uh, perhaps, Neil, if you want to, to talk more about that, you have much, much more evidence. Uh, at the I won't talk now, it's serious. Okay. Stage, but but the I, I want to leave some time okay. for another question, and then I think we'll move over to some food drink and individual conversation. Go ahead. Well, and, and this gentleman touched on it. What act, specific activities can older people do mm -hmm. to further the whole compensation process? Yeah, no, this is a, yeah. So, I mean, just, I mean, I, I'm here speculating because it's not, it's not kind of a specifically, uh, in my area of research is not in, in enhancing necessarily, but I mean, try to understand the mechanisms. But, but if I had to kind of uh, speculate based on our finance, I mean, because uh, uh, many of the changes, compensatory changes that we see are related to frontal involvement and, and also to kind of semantic or, or meaning, the engagement of meaning, I would say that kind of trying to find meaning, for example, it w could be a, a good way of, of trying to compensate. And there is evidence that in the memory domain, for example, in general, paying attention to the meaning is, is, is much more effective than paying attention, let's say, to, to the visual features or to other things. So trying to make meaningful associations and trying to link that in, a, in a, something that is meaningful to you and that will actually engage the things that you already know, and those are the areas that all the others are spared, and actually the knowledge, right? To the extent that you can... It's like crossword puzzles as opposed to the puzzles where you just have to quickly respond. Yeah, I don't think it necessarily has to be kind of a, like... A